and Somshila has not turned up. And we have the five talks, each ten minutes. First talk is Dr. Kalpana Babu, Shapes and Patterns Not to be Missed in UVITS. I think we should start, otherwise we will be uh, not able to finish it up. Good morning, everybody. And um, let's start off with a few pointers in history. A patient with uveitis with sudden onset and uh, pain on accommodation and photophobia with unilateral alternating pattern, this is usually seen in seronegative anterior uveitis. So when a patient comes to you with a lot of fibrin in the anterior uh, chamber, or a hypopion, and this patient is a young patient, usually the pattern falls in patients who have seronegative spondyloarthritis. In case they have a hypopion and they've had a history of recent surgery or any history of fever in the past or IV infusion, it usually follows a pattern in endophthalmitis. So when we talk about hypopion, these are the common differentials which we keep in mind whenever we see a patient with hypopion which includes seronegative uh, arthritis, endophthalmitis, Bechet's, lens-induced uveitis, and of course masquerades and certain drugs like rifabutin. The minute we see a patient with uveitis, it is important for us to uh, define what is the type of inflammation. Is it granulomatous, which is on the uh, left-hand side, or it's, gra uh, it's non-granulomatous or granulomatous? So when a patient with non-granulomatous uveitis um, comes to the clinic, usually the common differentials are, and they come with a pattern like this systemically, it is usually seen in ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and juvenile idiopathic arthritis. However, if the patient comes with a granulomatous pattern, medium-sized KPs, very large, thick synecae, lot of iris granulomas, and nodules on the iris, this is usually a granulomatous uveitis, and we should make efforts to look at the systems to pick up any clues. For example, this patient who had erythema nodosum or a subtle cervical lymphadenopathy which could have been missed. This is a patient with a bilateral parotid gland enlargement which is seen in sarcoid. This is a patient with herpes zoster where there are old scars. Sometimes these scars may not be prominent and you may need to look out for it. There may be old evidence of herpes zoster. And of course, vitiligo and poliosis in BKH uh, uh, patients. Now, when we look at the distribution of KPs, usually it forms the ALTS pattern, uh, ALTS triangle distribution. However, if these keratic precipitates are distributed all over the endothelium, our uh, differentials will be a viral or a Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis. Iris pat uh, the pattern of the iris can give a lot of clue. This is one such common condition which is usually missed. This is a patient with Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis who had subtle uh, KPs all over the endothelium, and you need to look very carefully at the iris pattern alteration between the right and the left eye. Otherwise, these patients are treated unnecessarily. Sometimes these pig depigmentary alterations may be much more uh, uh, visible, and uh, these, this is a patient who, was, who had increase in trocular pressures as well, and this was a patient with herpes simplex virus. Sometimes you can have subtle defects like these iridopyrrhosis, or uh, grossly there could be sectoral iris atrophy. So these are patterns which are seen in usually viral uveitis. Sometimes these inflammations or the KPs can be localized to a particular area in the cornea, something uh, related to the endothelium, and this is very characteristic of uh, herpetic uh, viral uveitis. And usually these patients have increased pigments at the time of activity uh, uh, on the keratic precipitates. So uveitis is usually associated with a decrease in intraocular pressure because of a temporary shutdown. But there are certain conditions in uveitis which is associated with increased intraocular pressures, which are usually fuchs, viral, toxoplasma, postnoschlossman, traumatic, lens-induced, and conditions like VKH, syphilis, sarcoid, and TB can also cause increase in intraocular pressure. When we look at patterns, again, this is how a choroiditis looks. Creamy lesion, which is quite deeper. Retinitis, where the margins are much fuzzier and more yellow lesions. Neuroretinitis, when the disc is also involved, and you can see this uh, star formation. And this is how a retinal vasculitis looks. So there are some uh, uh, diseases uh, in uveitis which are very characteristic in presentation. And this is a focal active retinal inflammation. This is actually a reactivation of an old scar. This is neuroretinitis with the chiralis arterialis pattern. 
This is a congenital healed scar. This is the characteristic head-like in the fog appearance. And sometimes you may not see any pigmentary alterations, but you can just see a focal retinitis. And these are all seen in toxoplasma chorioretinitis, which is one of the most common causes of infectious retinitis. Again, certain patterns are very, very characteristic, and it is important for us not to miss them. This is a patient with acute retinal necrosis with uh, scalloping margins. This is a patient with progressive outer retinal necrosis. It's much deeper, but the vessels are spared, and you can see the characteristic perivascular sparing. This is very characteristically described, serpiginous uh, or serpiginous-like choroiditis. This is a pattern which is called the depigmented fundus with dalen fuke nodules, which are seen in VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, and sarcoid. And this is the characteristic placoid lesions which we normally see in syphilis. When we come to the vascular patterns, this is how the frosted branch angitis looks in a very severe inflammation of the retinal blood vessels. And this is usually seen in cytomegalovirus inflammations. This is the chiralis arterialis, uh, which, is, which are uh, plaques which are seen in the arteries. And this is usually seen in toxoplasma. This is the candle wax dripping, which you see in sarcoid. And in ocular tuberculosis, this is the chorioretinal scars, which are described along the blood vessels in patients with tuberculosis. This is something which we shouldn't miss. This is actually more cystic, and this is a subretinal abscess with so much of exudation. This is a cysticircus cyst, where the cyst is below the ret uh, and it is actually coming out of the retina into the vitreous. And this is the characteristic, um, uh, the pizza pie appearance, which we normally see in CMV retinitis. And toxocara granulomas, where you can see the granulomas focal either at the posterior pole or in the periphery. So these are some characteristic patterns which we should not miss. It is important for us to look at uh, just beyond the inside of the eye and look at even the extraocular structures. Now, this is a patient with sarcoid and presented with only anterior uveitis, non-granulomatous, but just a look into the fornix showed conjunctival granulomas, which could have been missed. This is a patient with, again, sarcoid, and this is also seen in Jogren's and rheumatoid arthritis where there is dry eye, so it is important for us to do a Shermer in these patients. Now, whenever the uveitis is associated with a corneal involvement like this, viral is very high on our list. And this is also scleral, uh, scleral involvement. This is usually seen in um, uh, autoimmune diseases, but sometimes viral uh, inflammations can cause scleritis as well. It is also important for us to look at the margins of the cornea, the peripheral area of the cornea, because scleral involvement with peripheral corneal keratitis or peripheral corneal thinning is a sign of systemic vasculitis. So these are the shapes and patterns which we should not miss in uveitis. And once we do a good clinical examination, then we need to tailor our laboratory investigations, which the subsequent speakers will speak about, and arrive at the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice description of the signs and, sorry, the patterns of uveitis. And as we have started five minutes late, and there is a... Uh, four more speakers. We will go to the next speaker, the uh, era of technology, imaging option, what, which uh, can you do, um, and which uh, can you uh, choose. Dr. Padma Malini. Padma, please start. <laughs> Can I get the pointer? Pointer. The pointer is not allowed in the flight. Respected chairpersons and my dear friends, very good morning to all of you. I'll be talking to you on an era of technology, imaging options, which one do I choose? Ima Coming to the options, we have various imaging modalities available in a platter. Anterior segment like ASOCT, UBM, confocal microscopy. In the posterior segment, we have B scan and various moda um, imaging modalities like multimodal imaging and OCT NGO. For pediatric patients, we have handled OCT, handled fundus cameras. So we'll see which one to use in what condition. In the anterior uveitis, the signs has been nicely told to us by Dr. Kalpana, where we can use anterior segment photography to document the findings and see what exactly is happening in the course of the disease. 
Here is a case of a chronic uveitis where you can see the iris crystals which is deposited has been documented using the photography. Anterior segment OCT can be used to study the structures. Here you can see the endothelial keratic precipitates in CMV anterior uveitis. Here is ACE OCT showing in iris nodules in case of leprosy associated pan uveitis. The recent advances in the anterior segment imaging is iris infrared autofluorescence where we can study the iris changes and document with the serial photographs. Here again, you can see it's a case of a Fuchs uveitic syndrome shows altered pattern in the left eye with the petaloid pattern of hyperfluorescence in the pupillary margin with a reticular pattern in the ciliary zone. The next, we have seen using this written by microscopy what kind of a KPs we have. Can we differentiate the KPs? Morphology by using confocal microscopy. Yes, we have different patterns characteristically described in infective versus non-infective uveitis. Here is a case, globular pattern or multiple globular pattern or stippled. All these are classically seen in non-infective uveitic entities. Whenever we see a KP with central globular with dendritic or infiltrative or dendritic pattern is suggestive of infective etiology. Here is a case example of a chronic anterior uveitis at fine KPs. Anterior segment features looks like a viral. Patient did not respond to the acyclovir therapy. ACTAP was done which showed positive for CMV virus. Central globular with dendritic pattern of keratic precipitates Patient was started on topical gancyclovid gel. Follow-up after eight weeks still shows the pre presence of keratic precipitates, central keratic precipitates with same kind of a morphology on corneal, uh, confocal microscopy. At this point of time, we switched over from topical to the oral valgancyclovid therapy, following which we could see the complete resolution of keratic precipitates and inflammation in this case. The next, laser flarimetry can be used as a non-invasive, objective, quantitative measurement to measure the intraocular inflammation. Here is a case of a chronic anterior uveitis. The laser flarimetry shows the value of 16.5. Exactly, we can quantify the amount of inflammation. The next, we'll move on to the other modalities like ultrasound biomicroscopy. It is useful, especially when we're not able to visualize the past plana region what exactly is happening, or if the patient's having hypotony when you want to take up the case for surgery to prognosticate. In addition to presence of the pars plana membrane, we also look for the ciliary processes. If there is a blunting of the ciliary processes, then the prognosis is going to be poor in this case. Next, we'll move on to the posterior segment imaging modalities. B scan is commonly used whenever we have a complicated cataract. We are not able to visualize the posterior segment. We use the B scan ultrasonography to know what exactly is happening. Here again, in addition to seeing the structures, we also measure the coronal thickness in the peripapillary region. The next is whenever we have a retinal detachment, in a, especially in exudative, we wanted to demonstrate the presence of shifting fluid, where it's classically seen in exudative retinal detachment. Here is a patient in a supine and the sitting position. You could see the amount of the exudative fluid is increasing in this case. The next, to differentiate between an RD and coronal detachment, the coronal detachment is dome-shaped, does not have an attachment with the optic nerve head, and along the A scan classically shows double spike. The one more condition characteristic feature, it has a B scan, is posterior scleritis. Whenever we see a posterior scleritis, what we classically call it as a T sign, due to the presence of subtenance fluid in scleritis cases. So these are some of the characteristic things where we use the B scan to diagnose. Next, we'll move on to other modalities. Like multimodal imaging has revolutionized to understand the pathology better. Color fundus photography, we document the changes. Red-free photography is useful to document the nerve fiber layer defects. Fundus autofluorescence is to study the changes in the RPE, especially RPE choreocampillary complex pathologies. Fundus fluorescent angiography we use to study the retina and retinal vasculatures. Indocyanin green angiography we use it to study the coronal pathologies. With the latest technological advances, we can do a dual FFA and ICG together 
to study the pathology. Next, in vivo biopsy of the retina, what we call it is optical coherence tomography, can localize the level of pathology at the tissue level, especially the retinal and choroidal lesions. The fluorescent angiography is more sensitive to pick up the retinal vascular changes, especially when we have the presence of neovascularizations and capillary non-perfusion areas are well delineated using white field fundus fluorescent angiographies. The white field angiography is usually done using the Optos 200, where we can hear the fundus photograph is absolutely fine. Visual acuity is 66, has vitritis. The FFA shows perivascular leak in the temporal retinal periphery, suggestive of an active inflammation. Here, the white, if we have done the conventional fluorescent angiography, we could have missed this finding. As I told you earlier, the dual mode is able to understand the pathology better. Here is a case of a VKH disease where you see a disc leak, multiple pinpoint hypofluorescence with pooling of the dye. The corresponding ICG shows multiple hypo, sinus, and dark darts distributed throughout the fundus. So the extent of involvement is more in ICG compared to FFA. Here is a case of a VKH which treated with intravenous methyl prednisolone is a child doing fine. This was repeated in the follow-up period. At that time, FFA was absolutely normal, but the choroid shows hyposinus and dot, dot suggestive of active inflammation is going on in this child, and we started the child on systemic immunosuppressive therapy. Next, we'll move on to autofluorescence. Is autofluorescence map the lipofusion of the cells and other fluorophores in the outer retina and subneurosensory space. This is a normal pattern. The disc, the blood vessels, the macular are in darker color. In serpiginous like choroiditis, where we have hypoautofluorescence corresponding to the areas of the yield scar and hyperautofluorescence suggestive of active age. Yesterday in Dr. Vishali, she showed the characteristic four patterns what they described in serpiginous like choroiditis, autofluorescence and the role in the diagnosis and management in the imaging IC. Here we have three different patterns where hyperautofluorescence suggestive of active lesions, hypo is completely healed one. During the healing phase, we can see the hyper and hypo mixed together. Here is a case of a macular serpiginous choroiditis. At presentations, we can have hyperautofluorescence. Here you can see the mixture of hypo with hyper. And at the end of six months, you could see when completely healed, we can say hypoautofluorescence. Next, we'll move on to OCT. OCT helps us to study the changes in the vitreous, the retina, and the choroid. The commonly what we use is the quantification of the cystoid macular edema and titration of the treatment. Enhanced depth imaging has helped us to understand the choroidal pathology better, where we get the good visibility of the choroid. And all the choroidal layers can be delineated by using the EDI technique. The CDI, we combined both normal scan and EDI scan, which has been described by Bartiselli et al. In a single scan, we can see the changes, what's happening in the vitreous to the choroid. This is the conventional scan. This is the EDI scan where the visibility of the vitreous is compromised. In the CDI, we could see the vitreous as well as the outer border of the choroid. In the case of tuberculosis and sarcoidosis presenting as in the case of choroidal granulomas. The next is enhanced vitreous imaging where we had additional lenses a tube adapter lens to see the vitreous changes. Here you could see the posterior vitreous opacities with the retinal membrane. The swap source OCT has added advantage of the good penetrations. With a single scan, we can see the changes from the vitreous to the outer border of the choroid here in the case of a BKH. This is following intravenous methyl prednis alone. We could see the disappearance of the serous retinal detachment. However, the persistence of the increased choroidal thickness is seen in this case. Next, we'll move on to the radiological investigations. Whenever the patient comes back, what are the indications when we order X-rays or a CT scan or a MRI, PET scan or the nuclear imaging? Chest X-ray is commonly ordered before we start the patient on systemic steroids or immunosuppressives or biologicals to rule out tuberculosis. Here, you either they can have a consolidation or hilar lymphadenopathy or an effusion, or if it's a miller like opacities in a case of miliary tuberculosis. Now, HRCT has become a standard line of investigations to find out the pulmonary pathology. Here is a case of 
pan uveitis where the chest x ray was normal but hrct shows right lower lobe consolidations with mediastinal lymphadenopathy with free but sign appearance which classically seen in tuberculosis the ct scan so in addition to the chest we also had mri of the brain when we suspect lymphomas multiple sclerosis here is a case of a tbm with hydrocephalus mri as i told earlier in intraocular lymphoma multiple sclerosis or mri in the case of now the early changes in the sacroiliac joint are picked up much faster compared to the x ray findings the narrowing of the sacroiliac joint space is seen the next the visual fields what are the indications especially in a case of a suspected white dot syndrome we do subject them to the visual field here is a case of unilateral where they have a decrease in vision visual acuity is 66 on where you could see the foveal granularity with multiple hypopigmented lesions in the mid periphery in addition to ffa and oct findings we could see the enlargement of the blind spot in a case of multiple mns and white dot syndrome this patient was followed up following which there is normalization of the visual field was seen here is a case of a 23 year male presented with blurring of the vision with fluctuations in the visual field here again we could see multiple hypopigmented lesions in the fundus visual field shows amyanopic kind of a field altitudinal amyanopic field defect and finally turned out to be a azure complex next acute toxicity whenever we subject the patients in addition to the fundus examinations autofluorescence visual fields and oct electroretinograms can help us to diagnose where here the visual fields shows ring scotoma OCT shows abnormalities and multiple um, multifocal ERG shows abnormal wave pattern in a case of HCQ toxicity. Adaptive optics is a recent advances one can be used to study the cone cell count. In addition to that, we can see the parallel sheathing pattern of vasculitis in a case of a microscopic polyangiitis. Following treatment, there was disappearance of the sheathing pattern in this patient. Here is an 18-year female has got bilateral pan uveitis with peripapillary CNVM. This is a fundus photograph, and autofluorescence shows areas of hypo with hyperautofluorescence. OCT shows breaks in the Brooks membrane with hyperreflective echoes in the outer retina. And this is a fundus fluorescent angiography shows staining of the scars. ICG. In addition to that, we could see multiple hypo sinus and dark dots, suggestive of an active inflammation is going on. The superficial layer looks okay. The deep layer shows altered pattern the outer retinal layer we could see the hyperreflectivity areas and choroid also shows cnvm complex the same thing shown in the left eye as well and with the prominence of choroidal vessels corresponding to the areas of the foveal thinning here again a 42 year male diagnosed have a posterior uveitis where we could see the ill defined yellowish lesions in the posterior pole autofluorescence shows mixed pattern of hypo and hypo autofluorescence the oct shows classical hyperreflectivity in the sub rpe layer with increased choroidal thickness classically we see it in a case of lymphoma vitreal biopsy confirm the diagnosis of intraocular lymphoma here is a child who had perivascular sheathing in the mid periphery child was absolutely fine when we investigated urine microscopy shows candida albicans ultrasound abdomen showed perinephric abscess following treatment we could see the resolution of the vasculitis and the nephric abscess so depending upon the presentations we need to individualize and customize order investigations according to the presentation so a detailed history and thorough clinical examination still important in the diagnosis we need to tailor make the investigations to order according to the clinical picture thank you for your attention thank you for the as we are running short of time and we have to vacate the room in time so i will go to the next speaker dr sudarshan uh, here what do i order ordering and interpreting investigations in uveitis i hope sudarshan don't mix slides while presenting Good morning. 
Thanks for coming. So, <laughs> you all. So, if you have something like this, you suspect weakage. But if it's a granular matter reaction like this, you suspect sympathetic if there is another eye injury. In its typical granular matter uveitis, if you have something like intermediate uveitis, like picture, candle wax drippings, you either suspect DB or sarcoid, or both nowadays probably. So, then why do we need lab investigations? So, do we need it at all? When does it come into play? It comes into play when you see something like this. You don't know what it is. It doesn't seem to fit into anything typical. So think, think of lab investigations. You need support for all these things. So what do I order? Ordering and interpreting lab investigations in UATS. So first of all, lab investigations, you have to see whether it is relevant or not. See, for example, if you have a hypopion like this, so what do you investigate? There is no point trying to do like one imaging on things like this. So you order, if it is a young adult with history of backache, ask for HLA-B27. With a similar hypopion, if you have aphthous ulcers and retinal vasculitis, you order HLA-B51. You have a necrotizing scleritis, this posterior segment manifestations like this, then you order ANCA. But if you have something like this, which is re responding with the topical steroids alone and not recurrent, then probably no need to investigate at all initially. <clears throat> So it's important that whether uh, you are investigating uh, correctly and the, the investigations are relevant or not. So order as if you are allowed one test only. Like that's what I keep telling our fellows. So if you are allowed to do only one test, which one you'll do? That should be the uh, mode which you go on. And when you see something like this, obviously you know that you'll have to suspect HIV. So interpretation, when you think of interpreting the lab test, it depends upon the usefulness of the test, how sensitive, specific and reliable it is. The population, whether that test, there's no point doing tests for birdshot to the retinopathy or something like that in India where we don't see that often, HLA testing for those. The type of test depends on skin test, whether it's uh, relevant to that uh, thing. See, something like ELISA for uh, TB in blood in India, it's a wrong test. So, and think of the newer tests like quantifor which come into play. And there are some special situations. Sometimes you need to repeat more than one test, repeat the test itself, repeat the sample. Location where you test, either in the blood or in the aqueous or in the vitreous, and you need systemic evidence which will be uh, more helpful for you to go ahead. As Dr. J.B. keeps telling, like, don't go on a fish, fishing expedition. So let's start with the, the usefulness of the test. So the, remember that you need to avoid some tests you may not, which you may not depend upon the diagnosis or management. There's no point doing CRP or TORS tests alone unless it is supportive with a more uh, specific test. A blood LSA TB is not useful in India, as I said. Interpret some tests with caution. See, band 2 positivity it is very significant, obviously, but then borderline tests in endemic settings like India, then you'll have to think of other uh, supportive evidence. The newer tests which haven't been tested, you'll have to be careful. So you'll have to test appropriate uh, conditions. So for example, when we talk about band 2, something like this, a grand uh, uveitis with the large subretinal abscess, and if you have band 2 positive and AC being high, don't think that it is a sarcoid because AC is high. AC indicates a granuloma load. Decide which test you'll have to take. This is a typical tuberculous uh, uveitis. If you have something like a choroidal nodule with, uh, with uh, findings like this, and if MANTU is negative and AC is high, now, now you are thinking of sarcoid. If you have something with a MANTU borderline and AC low, then you are slightly stuck. So then you need support evidence. Something like intermediate uveitis with retinal vasculitis. If you have MAN2 positive, AC high, this is not TB or sarcoid straight away. So you need supportive evidence at these cases. So probably the easiest option is modify the lab test or like bribe the lab person. But uh, you probably need to go ahead with uh, other more uh, systemic tests for proving the diagnosis. For example, so which, how do you value each test? This is a 38-year-old male, vasculitis workup, all other tests were normal. But since we have this package in the vasculitis workup, it is positive for anti jo antibodies, I don't know, whatever it is. So sometimes you, know, you, are not, uh, you don't need to be uh, deciding your treatment based on a thing. You need to take some results with a pinch of salt, they say. So this is typically idiopathic retinal vasculitis. You don't need to worry about anything if there is no supportive systemic uh, evidence for these uh, tests. Something like this, it's very straight. You know that it is toxo. And lab test also was helpful. Toxo IgG, IgM was positive, easy. So ELISA tests for any parasitic infestation or something like that, so ELISA tests are quite uh, helpful. You have a scar, you have a reactivation next to it, then it's a clinical diagnosis. 
even if blood toxo IgG is mildly positive and IgM is negative. So you don't need to be thinking that IgM is negative, then probably this is not toxo. But clinically, this is toxo. So when when you have a doubtful or when it is atypical necrotizing retinitis, and that time when toxo IgM IgG is positive, then it's very helpful. But sometimes when it is not there, it's okay. The clinical diagnosis is more important. This is treated with antitoxo and it improved well. So when you look at the antibody test, positivity is more for parasites when compared to viruses. For viruses, you need PCR more probably. So if blood tests are not very conclusive, then probably you need to do intraocular specimen evaluation. Polymerase chain reaction is one test that can be very helpful, for especially for infective etiologies. So viral genomes are detected better than parasites in these. So interpret with these tests also with caution, especially the torch group because they are ubiquitous organisms. There can be multiple positivity, and when it's not in intraocular specimen, then you don't uh, think. But always, when in doubt, biopsy is the answer. For example, this is an atypical uh, retinitis. Blood toxotitis are negative. But since we had a high degree of suspicion, like AC type was done, and IgG, IgM both were positive uh, antibodies in the aqueous. Treat with antitoxo and resolved very well. So with strong uh, clinical suspicion, don't just do depend upon one specimen testing. But or in this situation where you had uh, something like this, AC type negative for MTB and quantiferin was negative. But uh, it clinically looked like a subretinal abscess and vitreous aspirate was positive. So we had to do, we did the vitreous biopsy and that was positive for MPB. So you need to decide upon from where the intraocular specimen sample is also taken based on the, uh, based on each situation. This you all know, chikungunya. So 48 year old male had a history of fever three months uh, previous to the presentation. So PCR for all herpetic viruses were negative and RT-PCR chikungunya had high viral loads. So RT-PCR sometimes is more, uh, sometimes rather like more, most of the times it's more dependable. It gives you the viral copies. It's not always so easy that you have a clinical picture so easy where you have a typical CMA retinitis with choroidal uh, uh, lesion like this. So life is easy if it's like this. It's uh, multiple CMA retinitis and uh, TB. But uh, when in, uh, in atypical situations you need to do PCR, challenges are like it can be false positive, RT-PCR is preferable. Just to remind um, all of us that I was going around the usefulness of the test. Now type of tests are over. Then let's see the newer tests. So they say no new broom sweeps well. So quantiferon after all it's not new anymore. In, uh, in specific entities how well is it tested? So this is the subogenous like correlatus where acetab PCR was negative and quantiferon was positive. So we thought it is TB. This is subretinal abscess where quantiferon is positive, clinically TB, quantiferon no, positive, so probably quantiferon is uh, be all and end all of TB tests. But here quantiferon is negative, a typical subretinal abscess, but AC type PCR MTB is uh, positive. So do you think that PCR is better than now? So in, a, in similar situations you have quantiferon positive at one situation, PCR positive in another situation. Even in clinically uh, highly suspicious TB cases. <clears throat> quantiferon we reported. So in spite of all these and proof, you might sometimes uh, remain proof or directionless. So that time you need to look for systemic evidence to, uh, to help you in which direction you go. This was a uh, HIV positive patient, a panuitis, optic disc hyperemia with edema. But MRI, we didn't know what it was. The MRI showed symmetrical thickening of the optic asthma and uh, chiasmitis and bilateral optic tract involvement. Uh, something like bilateral optic tract involvement generally is syphilitic. So we repeated the test for RP and TPHA even though VDR was done before and it was positive. So the systemic uh, imaging and other uh, systemic evidences might help you go in, in particular direction for testing the lab tests. In, uh, for example, another example is you will have to always remember that this was a bilateral hypopion. All uatic tests were negative in an elderly diabetic. We actually did a peripheral blood smear and this turned out to be CML. So when in doubt, when it is atypical presentations, you need to think of other options. Beware of masquerade always. So what to order? If you have a hypopion, then um, it depends on the history, either HLA-B27, B5-1 or always think of infection. Granulomatous, it is TB, sarcoid or syphilis probably. Scleritis, if it is non-necrotizing, RANA. If it is necrotizing, maybe ANCA. Retinal vasculitis, you have a wide range of workup, but if it is occlusive uh, evidence, then you probably think of adding anchor and homocysteine and other tests. If you have retinitis, retinochoritis, choroiditis, it is either TB, uh, trypanema, or uh, toxoplasma. But if it is atypical, then probably AC type or vitreous biopsy is the answer. So, first make sure that it is UATIS or not, based on the clinical characteristics. If it's typical, then no need to investigate. 
If it's suggestive, then do the relevant lab tests. If it's proven, then treat. But if it's not confirmatory, then the intraocular specimen evaluation and biopsy might help you with the proof and then treat. If it's still not confirmatory, then systemic evidence. So sometimes it's very typical. You don't need to say that uh, you need to run blood test or something like that to make out a fungal infection. Trust yourself rather than some chemical. Appearances can be deceptive. She's not touching it actually. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarshan, for eliciting the value of uh, laboratory test and how to interpret it. I would like to request uh, now Dr. Shomo Vashu to come on the dais and present that uh, what do I have on the platter, treatment options in my armamentarium. Good morning, everyone. After, uh, after the clinical signs and the investigations, we move on to uh, the treatment of uveitis. So before we do the treatment, there are some prerequisites. The first one is to determine the exact anatomical location of the inflammation and the degree of inflammation and the complications associated with the uveitis. Then, of course, the etiological diagnosis, whenever it's possible, differentiate between an infectious versus a non-infectious entity because that would make a big difference to the treatment. Review the systems, look at the current treatment, medications, the systemic status, and very importantly, learn about the natural course of the disease. So what do we have in the armamentarium? We have the topical treatment, which could be corticosteroids or rarely antibiotics. And we have the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. Local treatment with periocular corticosteroids or intravitreal corticosteroids are also sometimes methotrexate and antibiotics. Systemic with, again, corticosteroids, the immunomodulators or biologics, and whenever required, antibiotics. And finally, ancillary treatments such as retinal lasers or various types of surgeries such as cataract, glaucoma, or the vitroretinal surgeries. So let's look at each of them uh, the way we practice it. Uh, the most common topical corticosteroid that we use is prednisolone acetate 1%, though there are other options available. Uh, we usually start at the maximum dosage and then taper gradually. We also need to give cycloplegics, and there is a choice between homotropine and atropine. I personally pre prefer using uh, atropine, but then homotropine is also known to have certain advantages. Very importantly, we have to give clear instructions about the topical uh, corticosteroids. It's very easy for the patient to apply the drops in both eyes or apply the drops uh, when they are in a different frequency than what you would have advised. You might write too early, but the patient might end up putting just two times a day. There are some special situations, and these are like a very severe uh, inflammation or presence of complications such as cystoid macular edema where you might need help of periocular or systemic corticosteroids. Then patients who are steroid responders, we should not jump on the diagnosis directly. We have to rule out the other possibilities of raised IOP, and we know there are so many ways by which uveitis can cause glaucoma. And then... Uh, in patients uh, with HLA-B27 associated antibiotics, which is the most common cause, and also juvenile idiopathic arth arthritis, think of immunosuppressives, particularly methotrexate is very useful in these conditions, and in very advanced situations, biologics also may be needed. Intermediate uveitis, I think there are two points that are real take-homes here. One is we have to rule out an anterior uveitis with a spillover vitreous inflammation. On the other hand, it could be a posterior uveitis in which the focal lesion, the chorioretinitis lesion, is not seen very well. So in my opinion, intermediate uveitis is probably one of the most overdiagnosed conditions in uveitis because we miss out the primary location of the inflammation. The other thing to learn is 
the visual morbidity as compared to posterior vitis and even uh, anterior vitis is relatively low in intermediate uveitis. However, the rate of remission is also low. So whatever treatment you keep on giving, the inflammation usually tends to persist for a long, long time. Periocular corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment. Of course, we also have sustained release uh, dexamethasone with us right now. When you have a specific etiology for the intermediate uveitis, think of the specific anti-infective therapy. Now, one thing to remember is that periocular corticosteroids have a sawtooth decrease in the efficacy. So you give, keep giving on multiple periocular injections and the efficacy would tend to come down. So we, we must keep that in mind. And in severe cases, there is a role of systemic corticosteroids and immunosuppressives. Azathioprine is most commonly used in intermediate uveitis. Now, this is one point that all, I also want to highlight about this uh, condition, the role of therapeutic vitrectomy. If you look at this paper published by, uh, in 2015, the only treatment that actually decreases the uh, rate of uh, uh, recurrences in intermediate uveitis is therapeutic vitrectomy. So uh, th this is, again, a very important take-home point from this uh, discussion. Well, about posterior uveitis, it's a very vast topic, so I'll just put it in short. The etiologic diagnosis is paramount. Of course, it's equally important in other conditions, but probably a little more so in posterior uveitis. Systemic corticosteroids are the mainstay of therapy. Of course, when there is infection, you have to think of the appropriate anti-infective therapy. There are special situations where you need support from the intravitreal corticosteroids and immunosuppressives, and I'll come to that in the later slides. And again, uh, there is a role of therapeutic vitrectomy because this not only reduces the vitreous inflammation, it actually helps in resolution of the focal chorioretinal lesions as well. Moving on to corticosteroids, they are the initial drug of choice in almost all forms of uveitis. The main advantage is the immediate onset of action. However, Corticosteroids also have a very wide range of side effects and very frequent side effects as compared to immunosuppressives. Usually start off with a 1 milligram per kg body weight and then taper down as per the inflammatory status. The adverse effects require not only monitoring and the frequency of the monitoring will depend from patient to patient, they also need a lot of counseling. And this is a very important point that I would like to uh, mention in this uh, forum. Again, we have support from the local corticosteroids, the intravitreal uh, tramsulone astronide or sustained release implants, which are called as Ozodex or Reticert. Uh, there is a role of corticosteroids in infectious uveitis as well, and this is very important, as important as uh, non-infectious uveitis, you not only use systemic corticosteroids, but can also use local corticosteroids in treatment of infectious uveitis. And in children, we have to be doubly careful because the growth of these children can be hampered permanently if we use corticosteroids for a long time. Immunomodulators have an advantage of achieving remission if used appropriately. They are generally safe. We should not think that these are, uh, the side effects are frequent. In fact, they are much more frequent with corticosteroids, and the most common immunosuppressants use methotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate actually have a very good safety profile. We usually start at a moderate dose, check the adverse effects, do the tests, and then hike up the dose to the maximum level, as required for the particular patient. They usually have a slow onset of action four to six weeks, so the steroids have to be on for that amount of time, and then after four to six weeks, you start tapering the steroids. Of course, routine monitoring is required, and I guess all of you are aware of the tests that are required for the individual uh, immunomodulators. So it's mandatory to be used in certain diseases such as Bechet's disease, VK sympathetic ophthalmia, and also juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Methotrexate is the preferred drug in sarcoidosis, in anterior uh, GIE and scleritis. 
Azathioprine is preferred in intermediate and post-uveitis and pan-uveitis such as VKH. Cyclosporin is useful in certain recalcitrant cases of VKH and retinal vasculitis. Cyclophosphamide is relatively used less but is very useful in scleritis. It has a relatively poor uh, safety profile. And uh, the, I have to make a note about the anti-infective therapy, most commonly used for tuberculosis, uh, toxoplasmosis, herpes viruses, also fungal infections. Most of these have an intensive phase where you give the higher amount of dosage followed by a maintenance phase. Now, we have to remember that many of these organisms that cause uveitis, they also have a latent infection, and that often causes recurrences. This is very frequently seen in viral infections and in toxoplasmosis. Recent data shows that if you give a low dose of the anti-infective, be the anti-toxoplasma or the antiviral therapy for a long time, that is useful in preventing recurrences. The other issue to know about is the issue of paradoxical worsening, typically seen in tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, yeah. Can you, that, I, I'll just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it has to be differentiated from drug resistance and wrong diagnosis. Uh, the duration of therapy is again a controversial topic because of the limited knowledge of ocular pharmacokinetics. Biologics, uh, they are disease modifying agents, very important patients, GIA, and certain cases of HLA-B27 and beginners. We have the options mainly between the TNA inhibitors, infliximab, adalimumab, and uh, the B cell inhibitors, and screening uh, for infections is very important when starting biologics. Here is a uh, picture present, uh, lent by Dr. Kalpana. You see the dramatic effect of biologics after treatment. Now, this is just one very important point that I need to stress here. The role of therapeutic vitrectomy, it's not just in management of uveitis complications, but also the anti-inflammatory effect, including on the focal choreotonal lesions that are seen in posterior uveitis. Of course, they have the advantage of diagnostic biopsy for PCR or uh, any other test. And they're very safe. They're, yeah. it's, it's a completely wrong notion that yeah. there is a risk of uh, retinal tears or any other Five complications minutes. with vitrectomy. Okay. Now, this is a dramatic effect that you see. Uh, yeah, after should. treatment of this yeah. patient with uh, TB-associated retinal vasculitis with focal choreotonal lesions. Just four months after vitrectomy, no steroids given in this patient and anti-TB therapy. You see the dramatic effect that you see here. So to conclude, there's a big expanding range that we uh, have with us, but we have to use everything judiciously. The anatomical location and the degree of infl inflammation is very important, as is the etiologic diagnosis and systemic status. There are several emerging mod modalities of which biologics and therapeutic vitrectomy are probably the most interesting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Without any ado, we'll go to that uh, dealing with atypical UVATIS presentations, challenging situations, Dr. Bishali Gupta. Yes, I believe only five minutes are left to vacate the hall, so I will just take five minutes. What is atypical? Atypical, first we need to understand, is something which is not typical, which is not conforming to the type. We are all very fond of, and lectures oh, after no, no, lectures, no. you will hear about trials, about books, about the typical this picture, not... classical picture. But the patients do not fall into the books or the categories. Even for trial, out of 400 patients you see, it's just one or two who go into the trial. Most of them are atypical, so we need to learn to strengthen our clinical skills. I'm just going to show you one patient because I have only five minutes now. Now, this is a patient. It's a 34-year-old lady. She is referred to us with a diagnosis of TB choroiditis because her PPD is positive. She comes from a very prominent physician, uh, private practitioner in the city. She's already receiving anti-TB drugs as well as corticosteroids for the last two months and is without any improvement. So let's look <clears throat> at the presentation. There is choroiditis, maybe, which was diagnosed. There is fluid. There are choroidal folds. Now, what is atypical here? Atypical is if we had read our anatomy well, the choroid has those lobules. 
So when the choroid gets inflamed, it can produce focal choroiditis and when those patches get confluent, it becomes diffuse. How can choroiditis be inflamed in a linear fashion? Just beats the simple basic. Now this is the left eye of the same patient. You again see, well, it could be choroiditis, no, nothing wrong with it. And then there is this fluid exudative detachment there. So what do we do? Looks not so typical of tuberculosis. You do the next possible test, which is the fluorescein angiogram. That shows multiple points of leakage, which are increasing in the late phase. And this is the second atypical thing. If you're expecting it to be a choroiditis or retinitis for that matter, it becomes hypo to hyper. No choroiditis would show a expansion in the hyperfluorescent dot. So what you have is the dots which are multiply increasing in size. And this is the left eye. Again, you see, and later on, they are all becoming so hyperfluorescent. So any thoughts and what would you do? This is a simple case of multifocal CSR, which has got worsened because of the corticosteroids that were given for two months. And what is being mistaken here as choroiditis is nothing but a subretinal fibrin. Because once you expose the steroids, uh, CSR to steroids, you can have a lot of fibrinous variety. So you just need to know it clinically. So what did we do? We just stop his corticosteroids and ATT. And this is what it is. Because in the right eye, the fibrin has been there for very long. You can see fibrin getting into a fibrotic scar, which is linear. Again, no choroiditis scar is going to be like this because it, it should not be. And the fluorescent shows leakage much more or less. Some punctate hyperfluorescent window defects, but no active leakage. This was the left eye which had this whole lot of fibrin nasally. You can see the fibrin has totally disappeared and again the similar picture. So the question is, was it CSC, which is central serous chorioretinopathy to begin with? Or many a times it might have been TB to begin with. And when the steroids were given for TB, they could precipitate CSC. So we asked the patient to get the pictures when he was first started on TB treatment. And this is what it was. He still had this subretinal fib uh, fibrin in both the eyes. But if we look at the picture, it was, it was multifocal CSR straight away and it was not as bad as it became after we gave steroids. So what did we learn from this patient and then a series of patients that we have followed them? That acute fibrinous central serous retinopathy may masquerade as active choroiditis. And when we look these patients clinically, which we published subsequently, that if you see a dark spot within the fibrinous CAC, it is an important clinical sign. Now, this is what I mean. You have a patch of so-called choroiditis, and you think it's not choroiditis. It could be fibrinous CAC. Even before you do fluorescein or something, you see this dark spot here. This dark spot, actually, we have done all the OCTs and all. This is where the leaking point is. There where the fluid is coming. So when that fluid comes, that displaces the fibrin and that produces this dark spot. So anytime you see this dark spot, don't be in a hurry to start your patient on corticosteroids because most likely it is CAC and it is not choroiditis. So I'm not going to go with other situations, but the carry home message is that anything which is atypical, don't think typical. Think atypically and manage accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishali, for making it in time. I conclude the sessions. This is called pseudo uveitis, of which Dr. Bishali has told. And we have a paper on pseudo uveitis in ocular immunology and inflammation about 10 years back. And we have got various types of the pseudo uveitis we have described. So I thank all the speakers and also the audience for kind. Uh, presence. Thank you.